Hello, welcome. Hi, Hi. Suzanne. So Hi, good to see you. Nice to see you too. Great. Uh, so everybody, welcome. Uh, this is, uh, it's most probably now our, I think it's our 15th episode of Disco Creator Sessions. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, I know people are still uh, getting settled and joining. Um, Create, Disco Creator Sessions is really a weekly series uh, that was designed to bring a real diverse mix of creators, learning experts, thought leaders who are all passionate about one thing. And that one thing is reimagining the future of learning. And so it is incredibly exciting for me uh, to have our guest today. Um, when I think about you know, people and places that are at the like epicenter of designing innovation and innovative experiences, IDEO is a brand that is top of the list. And I am so grateful to be interviewing Suzanne Howard, who is at the helm of all of this incredible innovation, especially when it comes to learning. Uh, Suzanne is a partner at IDEO, um, which is truly the world's number one uh, leading design firm and is the founder and dean of IDOU. And we'll talk about it. it's not IDEO University, it's IDOU, we'll hear why, um, which was really created to teach IDEO's methods for designing, uh, design thinking, innovation and creativity. And under Suzanne's leadership, I said 50,000 because that's what we had on their website, but it's now 80,000 people have actually gone through some form of cohort based learning uh, through IDOU. So thank you, Suzanne. Welcome. Candice, it's great to be here. It's nice to be it's with you. It's great to hear you. Suzanne, I'm not hearing your sound. Just want to oh. see if uh, I'm on. Get your sound going. Hello, can you I hear me? I was hearing your sound before, so maybe there's just a small. Uh, Everyone hearing Suzanne? Oh, I, you're hearing oh. it, not me. Ah. <laughs> no, that's that's my fault because I tried to do like a fancy um, fade, <laughs> and now I understand why. So there it's you go. A, you know, it just sent us all into existential crisis, but we're back now. So totally, oh, that's really funny. It's like, yeah, the reason is. Um, anyway, welcome. So great to have you. Thank you. So good. So we have the next 45 minutes. I want to really encourage people uh, to ask questions and to get the most out of this time with Suzanne. And I think, you know, why don't we just start around like why, right? Wonderful question. Why have you been doing what you do for the last how many years now? Did you say? It's been seven years since we launched IDOU, but I've been at it a little bit longer than that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, tell us about why IDOU was created and, and sort of what you saw that you wanted to address. Yeah. Um, well, for, for those who don't know what IDEO is, IDEO is this global design and innovation company. Our larger purpose is to strive for positive impact in the world using a, a design or a human-centered approach to tackle really tough problems. So tiny bit of background, 40 years ago, IDEO started its work. It was dominantly around products and technology because we were started in the heart of Silicon Valley. So we designed technologies everybody knows today, like the first Apple mouse and the first clamshell laptop. But over those four decades, the community at IDEO really wanted to push forward to tackle more and more systemic and organizational and bigger and bigger challenges. So working in healthcare, working in education, working in food and food systems in the public sector. And so I came in about 20 years ago. And one of the things that I was really passionate about was not just creating innovations in the world, like things and objects and products and services, but helping there to be more innovators. So more people who get and know this approach. And that was well-timed because at that time, a lot of people were wanting to learn more about innovative approaches. We teach a design thinking approach, human-centered approaches, but there are many more approaches to innovation. And so we were teaching a lot. It's in our DNA at IDEO. A lot of us taught in universities on the side and did lectures and ran workshops. 
But for me, looking at this world and seeing what was happening with digital learning experiences, I knew there could be something better, both more scalable and accessible, but also just a better learning experience where more people could get what they needed and learn it in a better way than just a, a workshop or a boot camp. So I pitched IDEO Leadership to create what became IDEO U, our digital learning platform where anyone, anywhere, wherever they are in the world can learn these kinds of approaches. And so the last seven years have been about figuring out the right way to bring that to life so that we can not just broadcast a bunch of videos at people, but truly create transformative learning experiences. And so it's I just been a that. constant journey of iteration along the way. I love it. It's so meta, right? Because I think so many people on this call, right, are interested in designing learning experiences. So to have, you know, the world's best design firm and their, you know, university um, or, uh, you know, it's just so interesting to sort of say like, well, can you peel back the curtain and open the, you know, the inside look at how you actually think about designing learning experiences. And we're going to go there in, in two minutes. I think what I loved about, um, the way in which you framed learning and you use the words that are very, very dear to our hearts at Disco, which is, it's about transformational learning experiences. And you have a pedagogy or a set of principles that you ensure all your learning experiences have. And maybe I thought, can we start there? Can you explain why you chose what you chose and, and what that means? For the pedagogy, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we, started creating online learning experiences. You know, a lot of the approach is we study people, understand what they need, and then make things and just start testing and getting feedback. And so one of the th critical things that we knew about this, the approach to innovation is that if you just watch a video, it looks really easy and everybody thinks, oh yeah, no problem, I got that. But when you learn by doing, that's when you really feel the hard. And it's about embodying that learning. It has to be a visceral experience. You have to do things in an applied way. And it's very subtle. They're very soft skills. Um, and so we needed a pedagogy that would help people to learn by doing. So the way we think about our pedagogy, it's very simple. We just say it's a cycles of see, try, share, and reflect. And the real magic happens in try and share. That's where we're incredibly thoughtful about what it is, and we practice what we preach, we, we prototype and test constantly. And so some of the things that we do in Try and Share, just to illustrate, um, first of all, there's, there's a community inside of all of our courses. And I know you're passionate about cohort-based experiences too. They can be large or small, but in ours, we usually have a couple hundred people inside of the course at once. Then um, we also add in another ingredient, which is IDEO's human-centered. So we needed the right amount of human touch. So we have mm. team members and alumni coaches who are real humans on the platform facilitating the dialogue amongst that, that cohort of learners. Um, and then we use that try and share, and we really think about the right ways to dial that up for the content mm. and the community. So some examples are, um, we teach a storytelling course. There you have to practice storytelling. If you just watch somebody storytell, it looks For great. Sure. Really. When you do it and you feel it and you mess up a little bit, your audience gives you feedback that it's not working. That's when you know something's wrong. So our teaching team facilitates story slams where people come and they okay. prototype and test their, their five minute monologue and then they get feedback from the community. We also have in courses where we're highlighting the behavior of learning from failure. We have fail fests where mm -hmm. people come and talk about some of their toughest failures during that week or the last few weeks. And those, we look for those moments where people go offline and then they wanna bring it back online and they create these beautiful learning moments in community together. So that's a lot of what we're thinking through um, as we're creating these experiences. 
I love it. We're going to unpack all of that because there's so much like juicy goodness around transformative learning and all of the ideas that you're saying. And just if you can say it really slowly one more time, the pedagogy for every course is C and maybe just repeat it for people. C, try, share and reflect. And so and the idea is that you don't just go through that once you go through it to start learning and you need to deepen through that cycle over time, you know, so it's, it's a a practitioner's approach. So you're constantly learning by doing, by moving from C to try to share and reflect again and again and again. I love it. I mean, it, it, it lends so nicely from design, you know, design thinking and, you know, feedback loops and the OODA loop. Um, I, I just think it's, it's really refreshing uh, to hear that pedagogy, especially in a world where, you know, there was this incredible wave of pre-recorded course content um, that, you know, we're really excited at Disco around reimagining, right? It's not that pre-recorded is bad, it's that it's not sufficient in our, in our view for the transformative learning. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the things that we also think a lot about principles behind it. So there's, there's IDOU, which is a particular approach, but then there are also one of the things I see in constantly looking at other learning experiences and thinking about, you know, not just IDOU, but how do we design great learning? I think a lot about what are the tensions that we're balancing in a learning experience and especially today there, I mean, I, I invite people in the community to share tensions that they see too, because I'm kind of collecting them right now. And so there's like this delicate balance of structure and flexibility, right? We know everyone mm-hmm. will always say they want utmost flexibility, but we know if you don't provide people structure and deadlines, no learning happens. Happening. You know, we know it needs to be personalized and yet social. We know it needs to be at scale, but also engaging. And then the toughest one that I think is really an edge we're all going to be working on in the next year is that hybrid balance. So digital, but also in the real world, which is really coming to the Mm -hmm. fore right now because we're returning to our new normal post height of the pandemic. And we're going to have to not just have fully digital experiences, but things that blur back and forth. So those are the kinds of tensions and principles that we're constantly saying, okay, whatever the learning experience is, You have to find the right delicate balance within these so that you can transform people and really have them learn, not just binge watch videos. I love that. I love all of those tensions and I'll be sure to recap them for everybody (laughs) because they're, they're, you're absolutely right. Like we're constantly thinking about like how much, you know, structure versus how much flexibility is a great one. And as you say, I mean, I, I know some people are putting some nice questions in chat and, and one of the questions here is, is sort of in that way of like the, um, Kian uh, Fang says, how do you ensure people who don't have time are motivated to try and share? And how do you make sure there's psychological safety for people to share their work? And so that feels like right in, in line yeah. with some of the tensions you're talking about. Definitely. Like those are, those are two big ones. So time management and expectations are absolutely key. I think, um, you need to set the expectations for what kind of time needs to be involved. That was something that wasn't obvious to me in starting to d- design these learning experiences. We do a lot of work in the syllabus, in the mapping of the learning experience to help people get prepared for what they're getting into, because it's unfair to have somebody join something. And then all of a sudden they find out, Oh my God, I need five hours. And they don't have it at the drop of the hat. Right. So we manage a lot of expectations inside of IDOU. We tell people, you will need four hours a week approximately to do this work. And many people spend more than that. And we're straight up front about it because otherwise it's not a great learning experience. If there are things where you want to design something where people don't have to spend a lot of time, those experiences can be designed. I'm fascinated with a lot of the things that are being designed for frontline workers, where it Mm -hmm. is true micro Micro. learning Mm. and it's really there in the moment that they need it. That's a different kind of experience with different kinds of means. And then I love the question about psychological safety. That is a huge one. And we spend, um, I'll share some of the things that we're doing. Um, We have entire courses. We went on cultivating creative collaboration that is deep on teaching about setting the conditions for psychological safety. 
But in the design of the learning, we know if people don't feel safe, they're not going to share. If they don't see a, a community that feels like a community they can be with and learn with, they're not going to share their learning. And so one of the things that we've done to really set the conditions for more and more people to feel safe is, um, is with our teaching team and then the alumni coaches. So we have people from a hundred different countries, just to give you a taste of the diversity that we're holding. Um, in our teaching team, we can hold greater diversity. So at the, in the recorded video-based instruction, sure, there are one, two, max three instructors. You can't hold enough diversity with just that. We certainly try and we pick instructors who know the content but are diverse. Then in the teaching team and the alumni coaches, we can hold many more industries, ethnicities, genders, roles and expertises around the world. So in our teaching team right now, we've got 63 people around the world and they're representing 20 different nations. Yeah. You know, so with that, we feel like we're always pushing it more. The alumni coaches are, a whole, are even more, but that way somebody can find, if they're into healthcare, they can find somebody who knows that domain. If they're joining us from Japan, Hopefully they can find those people. And then the teaching team also, their role is not to be the diversity, but to point people toward other peers mm -hmm. who might be interested in similar topics or have some sort of commonality. So we're creating that peer-based connection with and through that teaching team. So that's one of the major things that we've done. I think that's so interesting. And I, I want to sort of, I know you're really passionate about diversity and inclusion in lear learning experiences. And what I hadn't really connected the dots on that you just did so beautifully was psychological safety and diversity and inclusion. And so maybe just as a, as an entryway into that, you know, can you talk a little bit more around why diversity and inclusion is such a big focus? Um, for IDOU? Yeah. Um, so we know for innovation, I don't think there's, there's very few people who would doubt that innovation gets better with more diverse perspectives involved. That's a major tenet of our approach. You need collaboration. You need diverse perspectives. You need people coming together. And then you have, you will get more out of the box thinking. Mm -hmm. And today's challenges are so complicated. Nobody can know everything that's needed in order to tackle some of these huge challenges in our world. So in innovation, we need diversity. We know what matters is a leader, a business leader or a cross project leader who can set the conditions for all of those voices to come together. Because if somebody's sitting there thinking, I don't know if I'm accepted here. I don't know if my, my point of view is going to be taken into account. They're not, they're going to spend all their energy worrying about that instead of just straight up sharing and participating in the challenge at hand. So innovation needs diversity, no doubt. In learning, it gets a little bit more complicated. Absolutely. If you have diverse perspectives and diverse learners in a classroom, in theory, you get greater openness, more perspectives shared, better dynamics for learning. But again, the conditions in that classroom need to be right for it. So I know a lot of people in the world of learning right now as diversity is wonderfully rising to the fore are thinking about what can we do to help more people feel comfortable so that it's not just that type A learner who's there, who's really vocal and public about sharing at ease. They're not the only person who's getting to participate. And one of the keys to that, that I'm seeing many, many learning experiences work on is mentorship, coaching, people who are there gently encouraging and enabling and helping people to A, feel comfortable, B, hopefully feel a sense of belonging, and then C, get the most out of that learning experience by collaborating. And so we're seeing many, many learning experiences doing this. One that I'm fascinated with is an organization called EdLift, where they mm -hmm. are helping students get through their, their first year in engineering and computer science. And it's two African-American women who are the founders of this organization. And they're helping to set those conditions so that people don't get shunted out 
of those worlds, which can be traditionally aggressive and, and not so supportive. Right. So that mentorship is one of the things that's helping more people to get involved. So that's the kind of experience that we're yeah. trying to create at <clears throat> scale inside of IDOU. That's super, super powerful. And, and it, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, that psychological safety connected to inclusive environments that are supportive really matter for allowing people to go through the vulnerability it takes to have that, you know, transformative learning experience. Now, I know we have a lot of course creators on the line and people who are really interested in how does the world's best design firm actually design these <laughs> courses. So take us backstage. Like you decide I'm thinking of running a course. Like how does it work from there? Walk us through the process and what we should all sort of be yeah. thinking about. Yeah, this is a key place where we better practice what we <laughs> preach, right? And honestly, I wouldn't know any other way to do it. Um, it's been really fun in the last few years. In the beginning, we kind of had good, strong intuitions about what to do and what to create. But really in the last two thirds of IDOU, if we weren't constantly in communication with learners and the larger marketplace, we would have made many more wrong decisions. So we think of it, um, there are three big phases. There's, there's picking the topic. What is mm -hmm. the content we're going to create? There's creating it. And then there's launching and learning, right? And so once it goes live, we're not, we're far from done. And so um, one of the most interesting things is how we pick the content that we wanna create. That has to be, you know, we're very balanced between doing right by our learners and also having a sustainable business model. I mean, that is a tricky thing. I think so many people in the world of education um, don't think through all of the business model aspects to make something sustainable because we're so passionate about learners. Um, so with our topics, we think through the classic for design thinking is desirability, feasibility, viability. So yes, it has to be desirable. We have to hear feedback from learners that they want it mm -hmm. at a big enough scale. So viability, it can't just be five people who want to learn it, which there are some topics we want to teach, but it's just not big enough yet. Sure. Um, and then feasibility. We have to make sure that, um, that we have people and content inside of IDEO who are credible mm. at teaching something that's not just out in the world for free. So we're constantly thinking through desirability, feasibility, viability. To test desirability, we are constantly in motion on that front. So we also podcast, we constantly test possible topics through our podcast and hear in conversation with people, what do they want? Um, we certainly survey people, but one of the most fun things is we're constantly thinking, what will people who aren't in our community also like and come and join mm -hmm. in the fun? So we do, um, we do ad sets. So we put advertisements out on Facebook, Instagram saying, here are some things we're thinking about making. If this is interesting to you, sign up to be notified when it's live. And that's how we figure out what goes like front burner and what stays on the back burners for the future. I love that. But yeah. Tell and then me, we just are you able to, mm -hmm. So good. I think I love the three um, principles or, or paradigms. I think that's super helpful to our community. What are the top courses at IDOU? Are you able to share which ones are the like the the most uh, you know desirable, uh, viable, and feasible? So yeah, this was a big learning for me. Um, you know, and then always in hindsight, it's so obvious, right? But the <laughs> the evergreen content is design thinking. Um, I think mm -hmm. at IDEO we've been working with it and teaching it so long that sometimes we forget that there are broader and broader groups starting to come around to that methodology. And so we do have certificate programs. One is in foundations of design thinking, and that is by far our most popular content. So learning how to use insights for innovation, learning how to move from ideas to action. And then after that, what we find is when we- Is that with Roger Martin? 
that course? No, that, we teach no, course. different one. With okay. Roger and Jennifer Real called yeah. Designing Strategy. So ah, that falls yeah. into some of our other pathways. So we've created certificate programs and pathways. And so some of those are around business innovation, which is also mm-hmm. very possible, very popular. And then our, our leadership programs are incredibly popular as well. Excellent. Super helpful. So that's the start, right? They're just going back. I know we're, it's so easy to go on so many tangents in such a short period of time. I love that. Super helpful. What happens next? So you decide you're going to create a course, help our community understand how do you go from we're doing this to now actually uh, going live with an experience. Yeah. So then we start design and development. So we have, um, I would say some of the biggest team of writers across all of IDEO, instructional designers, course creators, and this community is very, very creative. They start, we, we think of it as like a harvesting process. We're pulling in certainly the right instructor, but harvesting best practices on that theme mm-hmm. and title across all of IDEO and also reaching out to the outside world to pull in expertise from beyond IDEO whenever that feels right. Roger Martin is not at IDEO. We wanted sure. to create something with him. Um, so then we take that, start to put it into a curriculum, and that's where we start testing in and getting feedback. So in especially thinking, going back to see, try, share, and reflect, try and share takes a lot of testing. So we'll develop mm-hmm. the curriculum. There's always far more than we have room and time for. We edit back and then work on those assignments. What are the dynamics that are going to help people practice and and lead to that transformative experience in community with others? So a really good example of the kinds of things where we put a lot of energy in testing, um, you know, what's going to make people do it and then make them want to share. So a great example um, that Meg, one of our designers was telling me about uh, is they, we've designed a digital prototyping course. Mm-hmm. And people would just get blocked at that moment. Like, okay, make your first digital prototyping. Well, sounds easy, but it takes a lot of guts. And so what the team designed was these little spinner wheels where you would get um, a topic and a constraint, like a medium mm-hmm. that you had to design in. Is it digital? Is it paper? Are you using a scenario? Are you role-playing? And these little spinner wheels, you'd spin it on the platform, it'd land on a topic, make a retail experience only with paper prototyping. And then that dynamic was so playful that people could dive right in and it got them over the hurdle. And then since they weren't totally invested in it, they were also really happy to share because it had this sense of humor and lightness to it. And so those are the things where we really spend a lot of time creating and getting feedback. And then that last bucket about launch and learn. I mean, that's where we just mind courses over time and, and look at metrics for usage. Are people getting blocked at a certain point? Is there not enough information about this? A good example there is when we see a place in the course where people are having trouble getting started, we've just started putting up a lot of examples that we have permissions Mm -hmm. for other learners work. And we know that from learning science, when people see other people's work, it just helps to get them over that hurdle to trying and then sharing with each other. So, so helpful. I mean, we could spend two hours just on (laughs) this. Um, But I think, you know, one of the things that you're really bringing up is um, making sure that people are comfortable participating. Right. And so I'd love to um, just for the course creators in the room, like how do you train the trainers? How do you think about um, sort of all the people that are involved um, in actually running the experience versus just the content of the experience? Yeah, Uh, this is one of the things that's blown my mind because I never would have dreamed things would unfold the way they did. I'm, you know, I'm one of the oldest people on our team. And so I feel like I'm not as native to the experience of designing in community. So um, first off, we had some brilliant hires early on who just blew my mind with the ways they started thinking about designing community experiences. M. Havens and Olivia Vagelos came in and they just started 
they're the ones who really pushed it and said, we're not going to hire people and have everybody on staff at IDEO full time. We're going to hire these teaching team leads. We're going to figure out how to connect with them at scale. And now Jordan Henningman is leading our community, is taking it to even the next level. So some of the things that I've learned through that community design expertise, um, we do put out and, and hire the right people. Um, many of them have gone through our curriculum. All of them have taken something before they come in to teach. And then they also have their own practice in the outside world. So they're bringing even more to this than just IDEO's lens. They're bringing their own expertise. Then there is an onboarding process and there are amazing numbers of digital tools because this community is all over the world at the same time. Um, I'm impressed with like that. If, if we can make it accessible to the public one day, like the library of resources that are behind the scenes. So there is training and onboarding and there are rubrics and tips and tricks and best practices that are constantly collected and aggregated across the teaching team to keep making them better. And then there are ways that they can gather and continually learn from each other. So certainly Slack is heavily used so that there's always a place somebody can go and say, oh my God, I have somebody who needs feedback on this and I'm not quite sure what to say. So they're always there for each other. And then they gather regularly as well so that they can share feedback, best practices with each other. So that community, I mean, for me, is one of the it follows the principles of the future of work that we're just going to have more of these blurry boundaries where people are inside and outside of organizations all at the same time. And I think our, our teaching team is really an amazing representation of the way work and teaching will happen long-term. I'm so glad you're bringing this up because I think what happens for a lot of course creators, ourselves included, is you think you have to do everything yourself, yeah. right? And so you and I had this really good discussion about like, this takes a village, right? Just yeah. like most things. And I think it's really um, great to be surfacing that like not everybody's hired by IDEO full time, right? There's, there's a, a blending of community and new models of work that make this viable in, yeah. in many ways. Um, on that note, I would love to... Uh, I mean, there's so many different directions I want to go, but maybe just before we go to some of these questions, because they're such great questions, um, just your thoughts on the future of learning. Like you've been at the helm of a very innovative learning format, cohort-based learning for a while now. Where do you see the future of um, IDOU and the future of learning really headed in the next few years? Yeah. Um... So many things. I think one of the things that we think about for IDOU that we're looking at because, because of who we're designing for. So we are designing for professionals who, um, who don't ever have enough time to learn. I mean, nobody has enough time to learn, but the people who are working, who are at that, often the midpoint in their career, they've got young families a lot of the time or responsibility for elders in their community and lots of other things going on in addition to really hard points in their job a lot of the time. So time is of the essence. Um, so we're constantly thinking about how to make learning smaller and yet still mm. transformative and also how to make learning even more social. So mm. some of the things that we're working on right now inside of IDOU are are ways that people can continue to learn at work while getting their toughest challenges solved. So it's less, I think we, we broke some of the bounds of the traditional course model. And now we're trying to break the bounds of working with the notion of sprints and sprint-based, mm -hmm. but still learning experiences where you're upskilling while simultaneously getting things done that you need to get done as well. Because that was one of the biggest boundaries we found was just the opportunity cost of taking people out of work was a reason that work wasn't finding time to educate people in the ways they needed to. So that we've talked a lot as like the holy grail is getting your work done and learning simultaneously. Um, other things that my eye is on for the future of learning, I think a lot about degrees of personalization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can we design things that really 
very much keep learners at the center and meet them where they need to be met at certain times. So I think we've, we've had the model of Khan Academy for a very long time, but how is that going to come to the fore? I think mostly about adult learning and professional development or higher ed. And then I think about a whole, a third bucket my eyes heavily on is about incentives and outcomes needed in learning experiences. I'm fascinated with competency-based learning, you know, the things that Western Governors University is doing um, and, and many others are at the forefront of. They're not things that we needed for our learners in IDOU because of the outcomes that they needed. But I think, you know, for learning to be more accessible, more readily available to more people who are now they used to be called the non-traditional learners. Now they're the new majority, right? Single moms, people working and getting their degrees at the same time. We need competency-based learning where people get credit for what they know, for what they've learned in another institution, and they can pile that on and get to their degrees faster so that they can have a better life. So those are some of the things that I think about for the future. So good. So many great um great themes in there to unpack. And, you know, one of the things I know um, you do at IDEO is you actually offer certificates um, around learning, speaking of sort of like outcome-based learning. I'm, I'm curious around um, what you've learned from that experience around, you know, how do you deliver outcomes? Um, you know, obviously, more broadly, like the competency is a different model, I think, from what IDOU yeah. is doing. But how do you think about the importance of, you know, the certificate or, you know, and these new certificates? Because yeah. it's not a traditional institution. Yeah. Um, so, you know, very interested to hear how important that is in your offer. Yeah. I mean, as I was saying before, like learning has friction in it. So people need incentives. They need to be motivated and they need an outcome that's worth it for them to go through that learning experience. And so in every learning experience, I think that's a really important thing to think through for the learners, as well as the business model. What is the right incentive? What is the right outcome? So um, credits are really, really important in many cases. Uh, jobs are really, really important in many cases. And I love, I really admire a lot of learning experiences that are connecting mm -hmm. directly to a job market. We've thought a lot about what's right for our learners at IDOU. And of course, I would love to make everything accredited. It's, can we afford to do everything at once and what are your priorities? And so for our learners, what we've seen is that since they are at like mid and advanced stages in their career, what they're looking for is the ability to do their job better, to be better mentors, to be better leaders, or they're often trying to make a lateral move in their career, a sidestep into something that they feel better aligns with their personal sense of purpose. And so knowing that what we constantly hear is meaningful to our community are tangible work products that they can show to their business leader to their colleagues or to a potential other job mm -hmm. that they'd like to take. So they love those outcomes. And since our, our courses are all project-based, they are yeah. creating work outcomes that they can put into a portfolio and share in an interview. Um, valuable. They also really value being part of our brand and our community. And so when they have a certificate, we make sure that it is hard enough work and that they've actually delivered to have Mm -hmm. to earn their certificate. And then a lot of people do put them on LinkedIn to kind of signal I'm in community sure. here. This is the world that I thrive in. And then the last thing that our certificate programs really do is they, they signal what's next. I think people mm -hmm. want to go on a journey. They want to know, even if they've only done the first step, that there is another step that they could do. And then another step and that there's something larger that they're working toward. And so our certificate programs have really offered that to people to say, this is one pathway you can go down that will lead you to better leadership techniques, or mm -hmm. this is another pathway you can go down to become a master presenter or storyteller. 
So it's all about like so, what's right incentives and outcomes for your people. I, I just love what you're saying. Cause I think it's, it's not just certificates. In fact, in many ways, it's the project, it's the actual work and having done that. And it's being associated with community, right. Or a brand association. So so much more there, but we have such great questions from our community that I want to make sure we have time yeah. for. So this is from Jay. Um, Jay asks, uh, he's really, uh, he or she is really curious about what parts of the model enables it to scale to a hundred plus countries while maintaining the closeness of the community. What a great question. Yeah. Um, so with that scaling, I think it's a, a lot of things that we do in the dynamics of the learning experience. Um, so we were really careful about that. We knew we weren't going to hundreds of thousands of people on the platform all at once, because that would have taken us to just, um, you know, a prompt and a, and a long list of chat after a video. So we didn't want that. We knew we needed more. So one of the partnerships that we have with IDOUs that we work closely with NovoEd, and they, we chose them because their platform is very community-based and they have this gallery in their learning experience. And that assignment gallery with all of the layers of conversation on top of it is something that we've worked with heavily and hacked to make it really work well for our experience. So in our pedagogy, when people share their work, they can choose to make it private. And so we do have some teams from companies that hold their sessions privately. But by far, the vast majority of people share their work to the larger community. And that dynamic allows us to have just enough intimacy and sharing while scaling this all over the globe at once. And that there are many so more things, but maybe that's just a yeah. clue. No, I think it's so great because it is such a big part of what we're designing at Disco is the ability to be able to share and get feedback from community. And so it's actually really um, great to hear sort of your experience with how important that is. Yeah. Um, one of the next uh, questions is <clears throat> curious to hear more about the balance between guided learning and independent learning. How is the pro how do you think about program design and self, you know, does it, at, if at all, to include self learning? Um, and maybe you have, I know you have different kinds of courses, so maybe you can kind of yeah, talk definitely. to that. We, um, so one of the trickiest things to create an IDOU was that dynamic that people could go heads down, that they would leave the platform and then they would come back. I think that's always one of the trickiest things in a learning experience is getting people to then upload their stuff mm -hmm. so that they stay in community and yet I think almost everyone needs to go heads down at some point, right? And some people need that more than others, right? So we think a lot about introverts and the learning experience, what are the dynamics that they're willing to play by rather than everybody being an extroverted learning experience all the time. So, um, so we do inside of our community-based learning experiences, we always have moments where you go heads down that can be micro or macro. It can be like literally going off platform, doing something, thinking about it, and then putting that back into the platform. So that's very present. We also do have um, five on-demand courses that we've created that are accessible anytime, anywhere. Um, the Power of Purpose is one of our courses there. Um, and these tend to be things that are a little more self-reflective and so we do have experiences where people can do it all on their own, all on their own time frame. And we certainly have people who are very motivated and love those courses. I teach one of them called Unlocking Creativity. But we think, is that the right format for this particular content? Is it the kind of thing where people want more of like a library that they can go through at slightly more of their own pace? Or is it something that's better mm -hmm. learning in community I, and where we've had a differentiation is in the community side? Yeah, I, I love that you're you're sharing that. And you know, the industry standard or the you know uh, word on the street around completion rates, uh, you know, 97% of people don't complete yeah. self, you know, learning experiences. I'm wondering if you uh, if yours are different or is that sort of 
it's a little bit much higher. Yeah, much higher for the community based learning experiences. We have really high completion rates for community experiences. It rocks up and down like around 70 and sometimes up to 80%. Depends on the course, depends on the run, all those kinds of things, depends on the state of the world at the time. But we strive for very high completion rates. And it's definitely lower when it's something that people are all on. Um, I'm so conscious of time. We're going to do like really speed fire because I do, if you're okay, Suzanne, we'll, yeah, we'll, we fine. do want to address all of these amazing questions and we'll try wrap up um, within the next five to 10 minutes. Well, we'll definitely wrap up in the next five <laughs> to 10 minutes. Um, so the next question, which is a great one, and you and I actually talked about this um, the other week, which is how do you keep your courses affordable for learners? Yeah. Yeah. Um... We think a lot about the economics. So um, before even creating IDOU, I knew that the right business model that I was excited about is something that was for profit and social good all at the same time. I mean, that's just Mm -hmm. a, having been in the nonprofit world and loving the nonprofit world, um, I was just fascinated with how can we do this through a for-profit business Mm -hmm. and still have something that's really, really positive. Um, and so for IDEO, we are one of the most accessible and affordable places that people can access and participate with IDEO. There are things that are free. Um, and so we knew that we needed to charge for our courses, Mm -hmm. but we wanted to make sure that the price point was realistic and reasonable while at the same time, we're not a SaaS platform. We, we have real humans inside of our courses, so they don't just run on bots and, we know that the right content for us has to be high production. It's not just a a slide-based demo. So we think through a bunch of different buckets when we're making our courses. We think through budgets for development and knowing that we have to create at a certain level and we need all of that um, iterating around try and share. We think through delivery. So the, the teaching team that Jordan runs and customer support and all of our team that's there making sure that everything hums. We think through um, a lot about marketing and sales. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people overlook with a learning experience is marketing. And especially if you have something that's relatively speaking more honed toward a certain audience, not just general ed for the entire public, you need to spend a lot of time and energy getting the right people who match your courses. Mm -hmm. And then the last bucket that we think about is, is that we need room for constant experimentation. The content and the things that we teach are in a faster evolving part of the world. So we do need to constantly evolve our, our ways of teaching on the platform as well as the content. So when we bring all of that together, then we think, okay, how can we do this at the right pace to meet people where they are and still keep it as affordable and accessible as possible? So those are just like all the buckets that I would think through for anybody creating a course. How much do you need? Do you need a lot of marketing? Do you need a lot of development? Do you need to keep experimenting? I love that and super helpful for people on the call. And I also know, you know, scholarships. um, I don't know if you want to touch on that, but um, are an interesting way to keep price points high, but then, you know, to offer a certain set amount, you know, for scholarships that allow you uh, to, you know, have a higher price point, but also create accessibility. Um, yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. My, our scholarship <laughs> program is one of my favorite things. It's, um, you know, we knew there was a need for it within seconds of starting IDOU. The first question we got was, is there a discount? Is there scholarship? You know, yeah. often a student <laughs> discount or somebody from a part of the world where a price point in North America or Europe is just not realistic mm-hmm. for some people in other parts of the world. And so our scholarship program is something we're really proud of. It's something we also still want to keep pushing the boundaries on and push it even further. So we do have ways on our website that you can apply for a scholarship. We're constantly giving scholarships away. We've given away over 950 scholarships. Um, and so some of them are partial or for more of the price point, but we're, we're starting to tailor our scholarship program even more toward um, people who are diverse or who are working to in- increase diversity and inclusion 
in the world of innovation and design, because we know that's something that we and the whole world of design and innovation need. I love it. So I, um, there's, there's two more questions here and maybe we'll just do like super fast ones and, and you can, we can always continue the conversation on social. Um, but Zoya asked, uh, when designing courses on soft skills, for example, critical thinking, what are some ways to get buy-in from learners and make them feel open, open to learning new things without insinuating that they are not good critical thinkers? Great question. I mean, everything we teach is soft skills. And so um, I always think that's kind of demeaning to call them soft skills, but that's because I'm an anthropologist and I feel like this stuff is so valuable in the world. Um, so we call them the power skills. So when we're teaching these kinds of like uh, less rigid, less defined things, one of the things we talk about is that everybody has these in them, that mm -hmm. it's not teaching them, it's unlocking some of the things mm -hmm. that, they, that they know to some degree or a lot of the people who come to us, they've been practicing these things. They're just not confident enough to do them writ large or to teach them to others. So that notion of unlocking rather than teaching is, is critical. Language is so powerful, right? Uh, from soft to power and from lack to lock, uh, unlocking. Uh, I love that. Great, great insights. Um, and, and lastly, um, is one of your goals or metrics to keep your learners on your platform as much as possible? Clear, curious to hear more about the gist of the platform and the main metrics you track. Yeah. Um, so definitely with all things learning, you're thinking about relationships and, and metrics that we're pushing people toward over time. So the earlier metrics that we track, so we certainly track engagement, many, many different mm -hmm. engagement metrics to make sure that people are, are moving through the learning experience and they're not just passively observing, that they are participating, uploading, doing their assignments. That's the only way they can earn the certificate. You can't just click, 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 click and earn it. Um, so we look at engagement, we look at completion. And then we do look at retention and the referral like any other uh, digital business. With learning though and with IDOU, we're very thoughtful about people are not gonna take, it's rare that we have somebody take every course at IDOU. Right. And we don't have the library of LinkedIn. We have like 15 courses. So it's within reason. We certainly want people to be more engaged with the learning experience. I think the next learning experiences we're creating will take it to the next level. So it won't just be like, take another course, take another course, take another course. And then our deepest engagement comes from people who essentially graduate to become part of our alumni coach and teaching community. So there are opportunities for people to deepen engagement and continue their learning while they're also getting work done which is a powerful theme for us. Amazing. So I, I'm i going to wrap it up there because I know people likely have one o'clock. And uh, Suzanne, your insights have been just incredibly, incredibly valuable to our community. I could keep talking to you for hours and hopefully you'll come back uh, to our uh, uh, sessions um, in the future. And just to say what an inspiration you've you've really um, built something and sort of been a pioneer in cohort based learning and you know at disco this is something we're super passionate about we're building a platform for any creator who is interested in really creating community based learning uh, to you know, learn from people like you and leverage so much of this pedagogy and ideology uh, into a world where more creators are able to do this kind of transformative learning work. So, so much appreciation for you joining us. And for those of you um, who enjoyed this next week, uh, we actually have a phenomenal uh, creator who's joining us. He's actually a creator on the Disco platform. And we didn't actually touch as much on this topic, which we'll dive into next week, which is virtual facilitation. Uh, Jan Keck is, um, has created a virtual facilitator training community of 200 plus virtual facilitators uh, and runs courses on how to uh, facilitate virtually, which we've all had to learn to do. So again, thanks so much, Suzanne. My pleasure. Have, Thank you for having me here. It's just been an absolute delight and uh, have a great week, everyone. Really enjoyed having you.
Bye. Thank you.